Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Travis. Um, we're very happy to have Professor David Friedman here today. As everyone here knows, he is an extremely prolific scholar. And he is a well-known expert in the area of uh, law and economics. He has many inferential works uh, addressing many big questions. His first academic paper in economics, a 1977 JPE piece, addresses the economic forces that shape the sizes of nations. Private creation and enforcement of law, a historical case, a 1979 Journal of Late Legal Studies paper, has been one of the few themes that David continues to work on until today, and is also part of the, uh, the talk today. He's written a textbook in price theory, and uh, a very well-known textbook, uh, Machinery of Freedom, becomes an inspirational work for many libertarians, and it actually goes to third edition pretty soon, right? And, uh, and um, his other books are all about, uh, also about economics and law, but I'm really amazed to know from last night's conversation that he actually has a, has a book with his wife, uh, and, and it's about medieval cookery with hundreds of recipes. Too bad we don't have a kitchen here. Right? Uh, today's talk will last for about an hour, followed by Q&A questions. I'm, I, I believe the Q&A question is not restricted to the, today's topic. All right, so let's give a, a big, big round of uh, applause to uh, Dave. My topic today is law without the state. Most moderns take it for granted that both making law and enforcing law are monopolies of governments. That law is made either by legislation or by precedents in the common law system of judges who are themselves appointed by the state and that enforcing law is a monopoly of governments, that violators are detected by police, paid by governments, prosecuted by government prosecutors, and the verdicts are enforced by governments. Those who know a little bit more about modern law will realize that I have slightly oversimplified because what I have described is criminal law, but that in tort law, the violators are detected by the victim they are prosecuted by a lawyer hired by the victim, but then the verdict is enforced by the government. So that in fact, in modern systems, you might argue that the tort system is partly private, where the criminal is entirely public. However, the belief that law must be done that way is a mistake. That in fact, in many societies, both current and historical, uh, law was made in part or entirely outside of, of government. Uh, Islamic jurisprudence, fiqh, uh, is produced by schools of Islamic scholars. Uh, it is interpreted, was interpreted back when it was really a living system by a mufti who was a volunteer legal advisor and only the trial of the, court, of the case and the final verdict are under government government control. Uh, halakha, rabbinic law, uh, which is a legal system that's been going for a couple of thousand years now, uh, again was created privately. And for a newer example, uh, the Amish, who as some of you may know are a religious minority in the U.S., a rather interesting and odd group, uh, each congregation of the Amish has its own rules called the Ordnung, and those rules, again, are privately produced by them. Uh, law, in many contexts, has been privately enforced. Uh, the legal system that first inter interested me, in terms of odd legal systems, was that of saga period Iceland, about a thousand years ago. And that was a legal system which included a legislature, it included a court system, it included a law code, but there was no executive arm of government to enforce verdicts. So verdicts were produced by the government courts, but then privately enforced. And I'll discuss both of these, uh, these things a little bit more later. And in fact, there are systems, have been systems, where law was both 
privately made and privately enforced. And I am going to discuss four different sets of questions related to private production of law. One of them, and the one that may seem like the hardest problem, is the private enforcement of the equivalent of tort law and criminal law, by which I mean the private enforcement of conflicts between people who have no previous connection, as opposed to contract law, where the two parties agree to a contract, they might set up mechanisms for enforcing the contract, uh, put, post a bond, for example, or agree on an arbitrator, uh, which I will then discuss next. The third category is lawmaking, discussing historical cases of law being made outside of government. And finally, I want to talk about the kind of private law that is most relevant today, which consists of embedded legal systems, of legal systems which exist under the rule of state law, but where some group of people in addition have their own legal rules, which they enforced on their own members in one of a number of ways. And three examples of that are again the Amish, who are enforcing rules such as not owning an automobile, that's one of the things Amish are not allowed to do, not having a telephone in your house and various other things. And they are enforcing them not obviously in the courts, which wouldn't enforce such rules, but in their own system. Gypsies, uh, who have other methods of enforcing their own rules. And finally, Shasta County, California, which is a rural county in the U.S. a couple of hours from where I live, where for certain issues they are in practice controlled not by the law of California, but by the norms of neighborly behavior. This was the result of an interesting research project by Robert Ellickson, a Yale law professor. Uh, so those are all the examples. This is sort of introduction. And let me start with private enforcement and with what I usually describe as feud law, which I will argue is probably how most legal systems started. I have evidence for a fair number of legal systems that what we now have was built on top of a pre-existing feud law system. And feud law is a very simple system. If you wrong me, I threaten to harm you unless you compensate me. All right, so in some sense, all of us are familiar with it because in ordinary social relations, one of the things all of us know is if you do something nasty to somebody, uh, either you make it up to them uh, or they do something nasty to you. Uh, but in a society where that is the whole law code, uh, something nasty might involve swords and axes and various things more uh, powerful than calling people names or spreading gossip about them uh, or refusing to lend them something or the sorts of things we do in normal social interactions. So the basic logic is you wrong me, I threaten to harm you unless you compensate me for the wrong. In order for feud to work, certain conditions need to be met. And the first is that you need some mechanism such that right makes might such that my threat to harm you is believable if you really have wronged me and isn't believable if you haven't. Otherwise, it becomes extortion. Furthermore, you need some mechanism that will make it in my interest to not only threaten you, but to carry out the threat if you don't compensate me. Otherwise, it's just a, a bluff. You need some way in which those people who don't have the resources needed to retaliate which might mean in some societies being a warrior. It might mean having friends and relatives who will fight for you. If you imagine a modern system, it might mean being able to hire a lawyer to sue somebody. You need some mechanisms so people who don't have those resources can nonetheless uh, get, their, uh, get the threat carried out. And you need a way of terminating feuds, a way of making sure that you don't have the way a lot of people imagine feuds back and forth. I kill him, he kills me, my relatives kill his relatives, and so forth and, and so on. And so I'll be discussing the ways in which real world societies have solved those problems. And let me start out with right makes might. That the threat has to be more believable when I have been wrong than I, when I have not. And the Icelandic solution, which is I think the most as it were, developed or elaborate solution was to have a whole court system. So how does the system work? You do something that I regard as violating my legal rights. I sue you. 
I call you into court. The court gives a verdict. The court says, yes, you cut wood in my forest. You owe me 25 ounces of silver as damage payment, just like our tort system. But of course, it might also be, yes, you killed my brother. You owe me 200 ounces of silver as what's called weregeld, man gold, so that this was a legal system where if you killed somebody, his relatives sued you. Uh, and then the, you, you do or you don't pay. If you don't pay the damages, I go back to the court and the court declares you an outlaw. You have two weeks to leave Iceland. After two weeks, it is legal for anybody to kill you and it is a tort for anybody to defend you. Now, uh, if you're still in Iceland, I and my friends go after you and kill you. Your friends are reluctant to defend you because then they'll get in legal trouble and get sued. And consequently, you are likely to die. And in practice, most people who are outlawed left Iceland. I think the longest anybody has, is believed to have lived as an outlaw was 14 years, but that's a character in a saga which may be fictional. We're not sure if it's historical or not. But certainly, normally, if you got outlawed, you either got killed or left. Uh, let me now go from the sophisticated, elaborate system of a thousand years ago to the primitive version of that system that exists at the moment. The Romanichal are the main gypsy group in England at present. From my standpoint, gypsies are very interesting because the gypsies, as you may know, left northern India about a thousand years ago and they scattered so that there's a gypsy community in, in Finland called the Kali. There is a gypsy community in England, the Romanichal. There was a large gypsy community that were ensurfed in Romania for 400 years, the Vlachram, and others in other places. So if you're interested in why legal rules are what they are, you can say, well, look, why is this group's uh, rules different from this one, different from this one? They all started out the same, but they ended up in different places under different circumstances. So the Romanichal system is that if you wrong me, I threaten to beat you up if you don't compensate me. This is a small enough society so that the people around us know both of us and probably know whether you wrong me or not. And we have social norms, rules of behavior in that society defining when are you have or have not cheated me. So if you really have wronged me, you know that my friends will back me and your friends won't back you. So it's essentially an informal, primitive version of what the Icelanders did with courts and, and law code. So the result in practice is that if you really have wronged me, either you pay me damages or you leave town, the equivalent of leaving Iceland in the Icelandic system. Uh, there are a variety of other cases. There are a fair number of societies uh, like this. Uh, the one I probably know most about is the traditional northern Somali system. Uh, when I got interested in this, I discovered that the expert on traditional Somali institutions was a retired London School of Economics anthropologist by the name of Lewis, who had been studying uh, Somaliland uh, since the 1950s. And he described how their, their traditional system worked. It was a stateless system. Uh, I'll say more about it later, but the relevant part here is that they had traditional mechanisms for forming a court when a dispute arose and that court then giving a verdict that people around would accept and would to some extent force the parties to accept. Uh, there are other examples possible. But the basic point is that in each of these, that one of the natural objections to a sort of self-enforced system is that every man is a biased judge in his own case. So if the only thing that determines whether I'm entitled to demand compensation for you is whether I think so, I will often think so when it isn't true. So all of these societies, there is some external mechanism such that in order to be in a position to make a viable threat against you, I've got to persuade other people, the Icelandic court, the Somali court, our friends and neighbors, that you're really in the wrong and I'm in the right. Uh, and that way, I'm not really being a judge in my own case. Right. What about the incentive to enforce? In order for me to both protect my rights and collect damages, 
you who have wronged me have to believe that if you don't pay me off, I'll come after you. All right? So that means I've got to have some incentive to carry through on my threat. And one incentive is psychological. It's an internal incentive, sort of hardwired into our brains, which is the fact that when somebody has wronged you, you want vengeance against him, that human beings are naturally vengeful. And non-economists tend to think of this as just a sort of fact of human psychology. But an economist will say, no, no, this isn't a fact of human psychology. This is a commitment strategy. It's a characteristic of the human mind, which works. Because if people know you are vengeful, they will be very careful about wronging you for fear that you will come after them with an ax. Uh, so you can think of it in that sense as a hardwired or built-in commitment mechanism to make such a system work. But then there are also obvious external incentives. You wrong me, I threaten you, you don't pay me and I do nothing. Everybody else says, boy, is that guy a wimp. I could wrong him too. He's obviously going to back down. He's, he's not very dangerous. So I have a private incentive to maintain a reputation of being the sort of person who, when he is wronged, demands compensation and uses violence against the other person if he doesn't get compensation. Uh, and that's a fairly important incentive, given that I'm, in this case, living in a society which doesn't have police, doesn't have government, and therefore what is defending me against people killing me or my relatives or stealing my stuff or seducing my daughter or doing various other bad things is their belief that if they do those things, I will either demand, demand either compensation or revenge. Then there's a further external incentive if you look at the literature of these systems. And that is that successfully forcing somebody to pay compensation or else getting vengeance against him gives you status. It shows you're a powerful, able person. So that in both the Icelandic case and in the case of the Comanche Indians, who were another such society, you get the pattern that you have somebody who can't very easily enforce his rights himself. He's the person who has wronged him is a famous warrior, and he isn't. So another famous warrior says, I'll take care of it for you, forces the first person to back down, uh, and thus gets status for himself. So that's another uh, mechanism that helps make it work. Further problem is protection for the weak. That is to say, and I've given one example of how you do it with a volunteer prosecutor, but more generally, if I'm an elderly man, my only son has been killed, I want to sue the killer, but if I try to do it myself, I'll get beaten up on the way to the court. That uh, I don't have people who will fight for me, I'm no longer capable of fighting for myself, how do I get justice? And the Icelandic system had what I regard as a very elegant solution, and that was that tort claims were marketable. So I transfer, you've killed my son, you owe me 200 ounces of silver, that's a lot of money. One of my neighbors is a farmer with four tough sons who went a Viking in their youth. And he's got lots of friends and relatives too. So I transfer the claim to him. He prosecutes the claim. He collects 200 ounces of silver. If prosecuting the claim wasn't too hard, he shares the money with me. If it was really dangerous, maybe he keeps the money. But either way, I've, the person who violated our rights has gotten punished. He's had to pay damages or gotten killed. Consequently, people will be reluctant to violate my rights even though I'm weak. The Somali solution is interesting and rather complicated. Uh, the Somali organized themselves into groups of people structured partly by kinship and partly by explicit contract who have agreed that if any of them is wronged, they will help him get his damages and then get a cut of the damages when he collects them. And if one of them wrongs somebody, they will share the burden of paying the damages. So it's a pre-existing coalition or group of people designed to provide you what you need to be able to have the resources to pay damages and the resources to get damages by having a believable threat against other people. And this is done by explicit contract. Uh, one of the things I find interesting reading about, in particular, the Somali, because they're modern, is how they view us. 
Because, of course, we may think of them as primitives, but they don't think of themselves as primitives. They know perfectly well that they are noble people with the proper moral system and everybody else in the world is a little bit below their status, uh, which is the way most people in the world view the rest of the world, because they're different from them. And the Somali have a term for one of these dia-paying groups that is not based on kinship, that's entirely contract. So you say, I don't have enough relatives, I'll get together with a bunch of other people so there'll be enough of us to defend our rights. And they call this a pile of shields. And this was the Somali term for the US alliance against the Soviets. That our alliance against the Soviets was a big dia paying group, but it was a pile of shields. We weren't really related to the French and the Japanese and the rest. It was just a sort of a second rate version of a, of, of a dia paying group constructed for the purpose. Uh, so that was a system in which uh, even if I did not have the resources myself to pursue vengeance, I had already made myself a part of a group which divided up that obligation. Now, the weakest people of all are the dead. Uh, a corpse can't retaliate. So how do we deter murder? Why doesn't the person who wants to rob me finish by killing me and say, all right, he's no longer around to, to sue me? And the answer in the uh, Icelandic case is that my heirs inherit my damage claim. That killing me means you owe 200 ounces of silver. You can't owe it to me anymore because I'm not around. So you owe it to my estate in modern terms, to my heirs. And of course, if the heirs don't enforce that claim, they're wimps. Everybody can push them around. So you have an incentive, if you are the person who inherits the claim, to go ahead and enforce that claim. Uh, I should say, the term dia paying group for the Somalis is a somewhat bizarre term, because dia is not actually a Somali term, it's an Arabic term. Dia is the Bedouin term for what the Icelanders called wergeld, for the payment for killing somebody. But the English scholars who were studying the Somali, I think at first studied the Bedouin. And so they took over the term they were used to using and applied it to the Somali. Uh, in the Somali system, if I'm killed, the other members of my Dia paying group have an incentive. They want to collect a damage payment, lots of money and they want to maintain their reputation so people won't go after them. How about terminating a feud? Uh, there is a popular image of feuds going on forever. That's not what generally happens in functional feud systems. There is a historically famous American feud, the Hatfields and the McCoys, and the literary version, the story that people believe is one of a set of mutual killings going on from the Civil War until 1910 or 20 or something, but it isn't true. If you actually look at the history, what happened in that case was that three members of one family get into a fight with one member of, another, of the other family, and he's badly injured. His relatives seize the three, hold them prisoner until the injured man dies, and then execute them for killing him. That's the last violence that occurs for something like five or eight years. The uh, state where it happens uh, tries to arrest the people who killed the three, but this is all happening on the border between two US states and they're in the other one. So they're not able to do it. Eventually, somebody uh, who is friendly with the family, three members of whom were killed, persuades the state governor to revive the feud by sending bounty hunters across the state line into the other state to kidnap the people who had done the second killing, drag them back into his state and, and arrest him. So that's what brought it back, not actually the private few, but the state action. And a few more people are killed after that. I should say the state governor's behavior was illegal. The case went all the way to the US Supreme Court and the decision was that it was an illegal act but that there was no remedy. That once he had them in his state, he could try them for a, a killing that had occurred in his state. Uh, so the working feud systems have mechanisms to terminate them. Uh, in the Icelandic case, imagine that you sue me and win, I owe you money, and instead of paying it, I try to fight. 
if I get, if I succeed, which requires some of my friends being willing to risk fighting on my side, we injure some people on your side. Maybe we kill some people on your side when you come after me to kill me. Their actions were legal, ours were illegal. Because after all, I'm an outlaw. Defending an outlaw is, is, is illegal, it's tortious. So what happens now is that the relatives of the people on this side who got killed sue the people on this side. If they don't, if they get paid, it gets very expensive. If they don't pay, then this set of relatives joins the coalition against this person. So as long as you're not willing to pay court judgments, every time you kill somebody, some more people join the coalition against you, namely his relatives who want to collect the damage from you, and that makes it very hard. And my favorite bit uh, that illustrates this issue is a part of the Nyal saga. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the term saga, but it originates as the name of works written in Iceland in the 13th and early 14th century, which were basically histories and historical novels. And in the Njal saga, which is one of the most famous of them, there is a scene where there is a law case between two sides. It's happening in an open air courtroom in Thingvellir, which is where various things happened. And it's gotten sufficiently heated that it looks as though the law case is going to break out into open fighting in the, in, in the courtroom, as it were, in the, in the outdoors. And somebody who is a leader on one side goes to someone who's not involved but who's friendly and says, if we do start fighting, then what will you do to help? And the guy says, I'll tell you what. I'll draw, draw up my people over there armed. If you're losing, retreat behind us and that'll break up the fight. If you're winning, I'll break up the fight before you've killed more men than you can afford. So the assumption is that even when things are breaking down badly enough, so it looks as though they're going to start fighting in the middle of the courtroom, eventually when all the dust is cleared, all killings will get paid for. And therefore it is very expensive to, to kill people. Uh, one of the bits that I sort of liked reading Lewis's work on the Somali was that there was one point where there had been quite a lot of violence. And so the senior people on both sides decided this was a mistake and they agreed to raise the Wehrgeld to make it more expensive to kill somebody in order to discourage their own people uh, from getting too violent. So all of these are ways in which you prevent the feud from going on and on. All right. Feud law, even though it's not what, we're usually, what we are usually taught about, is historically very common. Anglo-American common law grew out of Anglo-Saxon law. And Anglo-Saxon law is part of the same body of Germanic laws as the Icelandic. The difference being that the Icelanders did not have a king and the Anglo-Saxons did. That the Icelandic account of how Iceland got settled was that Norway used to be a patchwork of little kingdoms. And the king of one of them managed to conquer all the rest and put it together into roughly what's now Norway. And he set up a much stronger government than existed before. And quite a lot of the people living there didn't like it. And the main professions of Norwegians at the time were farming and piracy. They were Vikings. And so they loaded up their longships with their uh, family, uh, farm workers, and as many of the animals as would fit, and set off for Iceland, which had recently been discovered. And after a while, they decided they needed to set up a legal system in Iceland. And they modeled their legal system on the Norwegian legal system, but they thought there was one part of the Norwegian system they could live without, and that was a king. So they ended up setting up a legal system which had no central authority, had no, uh, no executive arm of government. Anglo-Saxon law, they did have a king, and where our criminal law eventually comes out of is that the king claimed that certain offenses were not only offenses against the victims, but offenses against him too. So if you killed someone in the king's hall, that was a violation of his hospitality. And gradually they expanded. If you killed somebody on the king's highway, that was a violation of the king's peace. And thus, you had a system in which gradually the central authority got a claim to some of the revenue uh, from the fines for, for committing acts. But basically, that's where it started. That's where our common law, Anglo-American common law, comes from. 
Roman law, I'm currently working on a chapter for somebody else's book about Roman law. I think there's a good deal of evidence in the very earliest statement of Roman law we have, which is the law of the 12 tables, that it's being created against a background of self-enforced law. Uh, there's one passage where there's some debate about the translation of it or the, the text of it, but it looks as though it's saying that you have a payment for an injury in order to avoid retaliation. Uh, if you look at early Roman law, a lot of what's happening is private action. So that, for example, when you charge somebody, if you sue somebody in Roman law, it's up to the plaintiff to drag the defendant to court, literally. And if you win the case and the defendant doesn't pay, the plaintiff gets to seize the defendant, hold him for a certain length of time to see if anybody will pay his fine, and then either execute him or sell him as a slave. So it looks as though it's coming out of a self-enforced system. Rabbinic law, Jewish law, halacha, uh, has what I think of as fossilized evidence of feud. Because in rabbinic law, if you kill somebody, you were supposed to go to one of the cities of refuge, which in ancient Israel were certain cities, be brought, be escorted from there to the court in the city where you killed, be tried. If the court concludes that it was the equivalent of first degree murder, that it was capital homicide, then you were to be executed, but you were to be executed by the avenger of blood. Who is the avenger of blood? The heir of the person you've killed the person who would have come after you in a feud system. Furthermore, if, you, if it is found by the court that you did commit a killing, but it's short of capital, that it, 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 the punishment is less than the death penalty, you are supposed to return to the city of refuge, remain there until the high priest dies. So it's a sort of a random sentence of exile. If the avenger of blood catches you on your way back to the city of refuge, he can kill you legally. So again, it looks as though you're starting out with a feud system and then building this on top of it. And one of the rules of the law is the avenger of blood is not allowed to sell a pardon. He's not allowed to say, pay me damages and I won't kill you. Uh, which looks as though prior to that they were doing that. That is as though they had a standard Weregeld arrangement where when you kill somebody, his relatives either kill you or demand compensation. Uh, there's another bit of, Islam, of, of, of Jewish law that's sort of interesting, which discusses the case where the court knows that I owe you money, but they aren't sure how much. So it's the kind of case where we've done a sloppy job in writing up a contract. And one page of the contract says that you lent me 100 zuz, and another page says 200. And so the legal rule is the court can only make me pay 100 zuz because they aren't sure that I owe 200. But if you've seized 200 zuz from me, the court can't make, make you give any of it back because they're not sure that I didn't owe 200. And that again suggests the background of a society where one response to somebody owing you money was to seize it from him, was self-enforced law. In Islamic law, the part of Islamic law that deals with death or injury is called jiniyat, and it treats death or injury as a tort that if you injure somebody, you owe him damages. Well, that's true in our tort law as well. If you kill somebody, you owe his kin damages. More precisely, if you kill somebody, and it's what the court considers first degree murder, the kin can retaliate. They can insist on killing you, but they don't have to. They have the option of accepting a payment of a certain number of camels uh, as compensation for the killing. Uh, so I should say there's also another penalty, which is a penalty owed to God, which is that if you've killed somebody, you are supposed to either free one Muslim slave or fast for two months. Muslim fast is only during daytime, so you don't starve to death in, in two months. You can eat at night. Uh, but aside from that, uh, it's really being treated as a tort against the victim or if he's not around his kin. So again, all of these seem to me to suggest pretty strongly that, you have, that what we've now got is a legal system that was built on top of a pre-existing feud system. All right, so far I've been talking about what on the face of it seems like the hardest case, namely enforcing legal rights between strangers. 
what about contracts? And I have an article which is from Imperial China to Cyberspace, uh, Contracts Without the Law, or some title like that. And it started with some stuff I read about Imperial China. Uh, as you may know, in about 1908 or so, the Chinese uh, conceded Taiwan to Japan after it's part of a treaty. And the Japanese decided that instead of trying to enforce Japanese law in Taiwan, they would just enforce Chinese law. And to do that, they had to find out what it was. And so there was a lengthy scholarly project by Japanese scholars at the beginning of the 20th century researching what the legal system was on Taiwan. And it survived. And what I've read is an English language book which mined that project for information about the law. And at least the conclusion of that book was that in Taiwan at the beginning of the 20th century, there was virtually no contract law and very elaborate contractual practice. And the question is, how did they do it? And one way of doing it could have been if the contractual activities had been within an extended family or within a guild, within some authority structure other than the state that could enforce it. But in fact, that wasn't the case, that merchants in Taiwan were doing contracts across the straits, trading with people some distance away, importing and exporting and so forth. Uh, so that raises interesting issues that I'll come back to in a minute uh, about how you can make contracts enforceable when you don't have courts to enforce it. I've been arguing for some time that doing business online raises very similar issues. That in cyberspace, national boundaries are invisible. So when you buy something online, you may well not know what country the seller is in. That makes it relatively hard to use government courts. Besides which, using courts for international transactions is a pain. Uh, after all, the court will be very far from the location of one of the parties or both parties. It's doable for a big business firm that has lawyers on retainer who specialize on it, but for ordinary people doing business online, it's not really very workable. So that means that you may again get into a situation where you want ways of enforcing contracts that don't depend on courts. And as I've discussed in other things, uh, the online technology, in particular public key encryption, makes it possible to combine anonymity with reputation which may be a desirable thing to do if you're doing things that other people would like to stop. Uh, and it's really hard to sue somebody if you don't know who he is. Uh, and yet you might want to do business with anonymous people. Article on my webpage goes into details on that. So let me say a bit about one of the answers, which is reputational enforcement. Let us imagine that I buy a jacket, a suit jacket from a department store and the department store says money back if you don't like it. And I get home and my wife suggests that purple is not really my color. And so I take the jacket back to the store and they refuse to take it. They make up some excuse. What happens? Or putting it differently, why don't they act that way? Why do they in fact keep their promise? The reason is usually not that they're afraid I'll sue them that if you're thinking about something as small as the value of a jacket, the time and trouble of a lawsuit, at least in the US, are usually too much to make it worth doing. What they're worried about is that I'll tell everybody I know that you shouldn't shop in that department store because they cheat you. So they're worried about their reputation. If you think about the logic of reputational enforcement, it is one of the interesting economic cases where you have an activity which people do because it's in their own interest, which provides a useful service, but the fact that it's in their interest is independent of the service. It's, as it were, an accidental uh, incentive. Because the function of reputational enforcement is making the store keep its contracts. But the reason that my friends don't buy from the store after I tell them my story of being cheated is not that they're trying to punish the store, not that they're trying to help me, but that they don't want to be cheated themselves. In fact, my enemies won't buy from the store either if they believe that the store cheated me. All right? So uh, reputational in enforcement, what drives it is the desire of the interested third party not to deal with someone who has a bad reputation, but its actual effect is to provide a mechanism for enforcing contracts without courts.
making it in the interest of, of firms to keep their promises. Now, there's a problem here. Suppose not a store, suppose not my friends, I have a contract with you over something, and you cheat, you break the contract. And I loudly announce you've cheated me. You being a sensible person say, I didn't cheat him, he's trying to cheat me. If the third parties can't tell which of us is telling the truth, what is their rational response? To avoid doing business with either of us, right? Their response is, one of them is a cheater, we don't know which one, let's find someone else to do business with. Since I realize that's the case, I never report you because reporting you will only hurt me. So what that means is that in order for reputational enforcement to work, it's got to be easy for interested third parties to find out who's in the right. And that therefore, what part of what you need to set up a system where reputational enforcement makes people keep their contracts is organizing things in such a way that when someone cheats, it's reasonably easy for other people to find out. So that part of that in Imperial China was the use of a chop, of a, of a seal, a stamp, because that would prove what you had agreed to. So if you agreed in a contract to buy a bunch of wheat from me at a certain price, comes the delivery day and the price of wheat has gone down, so you want to back out of the contract, there are other people who are watching as I try to sell you the wheat, you refuse to pay for it. I can show the contract. The contract proves you signed it because there is your, your stamp on it or your thumbprint, but probably your stamp. Uh, therefore, they know that they shouldn't deal with you. So that's one of the ways you do it. Uh, the cyberspace equivalent is even cuter. Again, I'm not going to explain public key encryption because that would be another talk. Some of you probably know about it and some of you don't, but essentially, public key encryption can be used to produce digital signatures. So the result is we write a contract. One of the things the contract specifies is the arbitrator we are agreeing to who will judge disputes between us. The contract includes the public key of the arbitrator, which is the piece of information you need to check his digital signature. And it is then digitally signed by both of us. And both of us have copies. Now, you do something that I think is cheating me. I demand arbitration. The arbitrator looks at the case and he says, you owe me $100 in damages. You refuse to pay. The arbitrator writes up the statement, Travis uh, owed, Travis agreed to my arbitration and then refused to pay the damages I said he owed to, he owed to David. He digitally signs it, gives me a copy. I put a copy of that up on a web page with, your, with Travis's name all over it. Anybody who wants to deal with Travis, of course, does a Google search to find out what he can learn about Travis. He finds that document. All he needs to do is to check the digital signatures, and he now knows that Travis agreed to that arbitrator, and that arbitrator says that Travis then broke his agreement and didn't, didn't fulfill the contract. All right. So it's a very, very low-cost way of telling third parties what happened using an arbitrator. Uh, another way, and one which existed in the Chinese case, is to try to have rules for contracts that make it as easy as possible to see whether somebody broke them. And the simplest such rule is the rule we call caveat emptor. That means let the buyer beware. And caveat emptor says that once I've accepted the delivery on products, I'm taking them as I got them. So if I accept delivery on a whole lot of grain and I discover a week later that half of it is rotten, tough luck, I should have checked it when I got it. All right, so the caveat emptor rule means that you don't have the situation where the way in which you cheated me was to deliver products which were not as good as you claimed they were, because that isn't cheating once I've accepted, that my inspection is what determines that the contract is fulfilled. So you can think of various ways in which you can structure your, the rules of, uh, of doing business so that so far as possible, the things that count as cheating are things that are relatively easy for other parties to observe. So all of that is, has to do with the ways in which the Chinese a century ago uh, succeeded in contractual practice without contractual law.
And when I'm teaching in a law school, I tell my students, all of this should be important to you as well. Because even though you can sue people, you'd rather not. That getting involved with courts is expensive. And therefore, in the modern world, you would like as best you can to structure your contracts in ways that keep them out of court, in ways that are as much as possible self-enforcing. And I will get a little further because another part of how you avoid the problem of enforcing contracts is to structure your contract in such a way that there is no point in time at which either party profits by breaking it. You can't always do it, but you can try. So if you imagine that I want a house built or something else done, a computer program written, if I pay you in advance in a world with no courts, you can take the money and leave. If you perform in advance, if you build the house, after you build the house, I say, well, yes, I said I'd pay you $100,000, but times are hard, won't you take 50,000? You won't? Well, house is sitting on my land. You want to tear it down again? Feel free. All right, so in either case, so the result is that the normal way you deal with that is that I pay you money as you're building the house. I pay you enough money so that at each stage, if you pull out, you'll be worse off and I'll be worse off. All right, I'll have a half-built house that I've half paid for. Uh, now, in an uncertain, uncertain world, you can't always do that because things can change over time. The price of houses goes up or down. The price of wheat goes up or down. You have a contract, and the relevant conditions that might make it in your interest to cheat could change. One way of trying to solve that problem is by shifting the incentives by things like deposits. And the problem is that if I pay, give you a deposit in advance, that reduces my incentive to break the contract because I'll lose the deposit, but it increases your incentive because without a court, you'll just keep the deposit. One solution to that is to replace a deposit with a hostage. A hostage is something that it hurts me to lose but doesn't help you to get. My son, for example. That's the traditional hostage in medieval societies. So if you use a hostage, that doesn't give you an incentive to break the contract, but it does give me an incentive to fulfill the contract. And of course, hostages don't have to be people. It could be anything where I'm creating a situation where you can harm me in a way that doesn't benefit you. Indeed, you could argue that in the imperial Chinese case, where you didn't have contract law, but you did have criminal law such that when you cheated me, I could go to the district magistrate and say he's a swindler, charge him with being a swindler, please, and punish him for it. My ability to make that charge functions like a hostage and it doesn't do me any good, but it hurts you and therefore is a reason, one of the reasons why you would avoid, avoid cheating me. How do we combine reputation and structure? In the real world, not everybody has a reputation. You might be somebody who is a single one-time player. You're only doing this once. Uh, you're only buying one house ever. And if the people who build houses decide you can't be trusted, you don't care. Other, you can think of other contexts, lots of other contexts. And the basic answer is that if one party has a reputation, you then don't have to worry much about his breaking the contract. So you set up, you structure the contract so that he's the only one who might have an incentive to, to do it. So if we know that you have a big reputation, it'll hurt you a lot if it turns out you've cheated me, I pay in advance. You won't keep the money and run because that would destroy your reputation. And once I've paid in advance, uh, I have no way of, uh, left of cheating you. All right, so you can imagine setting things up in such a way that the risk of having an incentive for what we call opportunistic breach, breaking the contract because it's profitable, to do so is put on the person who has a reputational incentive not to do it. And I think if you look at actual contractual practice, at least in my society, this is really a very common pattern. That there are lots of cases where when you're buying something, for example, you pay in advance, especially if you order by mail order or online, you pay them in advance, you trust them to deliver. Why? Because you as a consumer have no reputation, but they as a seller have a reputation. And there are other cases where you contractually agree to some to terms that you don't expect will be enforced, 
because giving them sort of all the advantage means that if you do try to cheat them, they can easily win the case and they don't have an incentive to try to enforce things against you because then you, they'll get the reputation of being people it's a mistake to deal with. So I think that's actually quite, quite common. Uh, what if neither of us has a reputation? In that case, we rent a third party's reputation that you can imagine easily enough that we not only have an arbitrator we trust, we agree that each of us will deposit a thousand dollar bond with the arbitrator. And if, if the arbitrator finds that one of us cheated, he transfers that person's bond to the other party. And this only depends on the arbitrator having a good enough reputation so we're sure he won't just pocket the bonds. The most familiar version of this uh, in the modern society is an escrow agency. Uh, somebody on eBay is selling what he claims is a Ming vase, some valuable antique. If it's true, it's worth a lot of money, but it might not, it might be a fake. So uh, what happens? He sends the vase to an escrow agency. They hold it. I, the buyer, goes in and inspect it. If it really is what it claims to be, I send him the money and he instructs the escrow agency to turn the vase over to me. If it isn't what it claims to be, the escrow agency sends him back the vase. So that's a way in which neither he nor I needs a reputation, only the escrow agency needs a reputation to make sure they don't just keep the vase and, and not pay anybody anything. So all of these are ways in which you can enforce contracts without the state. Let me go on to lawmaking, which I'm gonna talk about a little more briefly. Uh, rabbinic law, Halacha, uh, the Kingdom of Israel was conquered by the Romans a few hundred BC, I think 150 BC, something like that. Later there were a couple, it was sort of a, it wasn't part of the Roman Empire, but it was under Roman domination. There were a couple of revolts and the final result resulted in enormous destruction and a lot of the inhabitants of Israel went elsewhere. And that was the diaspora, which scattered Jewish communities, just like the gypsy communities later, in that case, initially around the Mediterranean world and then, then further on later. And when there was a kingdom of Israel, there was uh, a institution which functioned as a Supreme Court, but that more or less disappeared a while after the kingdom of Israel disappeared. And that meant you had a whole lot of dispersed communities. And oddly enough, for 1,600 years, 1,500 years after the destruction of the Kingdom of Israel, most Jews were living under Jewish law. Why? Because the rulers, Christian and Muslim, of the places where the diaspora were, found that the easiest way of dealing with their Jewish subjects was to subcontract the job to the Jewish authorities. So the typical deal was the Jewish community will pay us a certain amount of taxes each year. It will guarantee that its people don't give us any trouble, and then it can rule its own people. We'll even enforce the verdicts of its courts. So you had a whole bunch of scattered communities with their own communal authorities. Where did their law come from? Scholars studied the opinions of past legal experts, which were first really collected in the Mishnah, which was somewhere around 0 AD or maybe a little before that, which was a collection, basically a big thick book. I concluded after I got interested in Jewish law that it was probably the best documented legal system in history of the world. Now, it's possible that Chinese law is a competitor, but so little of the information is in a language I can read that I'm not in a position to judge it very well. That'll probably change over the next 30 or 40 years. But in the case of Jewish law, we've got a thick treatise from almost 2,000 years ago and a whole series of things written since then. And it was all done by scholars who had no political authority. They hadn't been appointed judge or anything of the sort. But if you were the judge in a community, and you had a hard case, you would write to one of the famous scholars, somebody like Maimonides, for example, and you would say, here is my case, what should I do? And you would eventually get an answer back, and if he was someone you respected, you would do what he said. And some of these scholars would eventually put together their opinions into books, and in one or another parts of the diaspora, people would say, well, the best source of law is so-and-so, let's follow that. 
So it was a system in which you had a very elaborate and sophisticated legal system with no legislature to make it. Uh, Fiqh Islamic law, you get a somewhat similar pattern. Uh, one of the doctrines of Islamic law is the separation of law and state. Now, in reality, it isn't entirely true. I'm giving you a sort of a simplified version. And there are various ways in which ruling authorities sort of claim they're filling in the gaps in Islamic law with their own decisions. But at least in principle, what's going on is that the law is made by God, that human scholars try to figure out what God's law is, and that then courts try to enforce it. People who talk about Islamic law often use the term Sharia, and I think they are misunderstanding it. As best I can tell, Sharia really represents law in the mind of God, and that conceptually, Islamic law is not the work of men, nor is it enforced by men. That is, men are allowed to enforce, but that's not what it really is. That what it re Islamic law classifies all actions into five categories, from obligatory down to forbidden, in very three intermediate categories. What obligatory means is that if you do it, God will reward you in the afterlife. And if you fail to do it, God will punish you in the afterlife. What forbidden means is that if you refrain from doing it, God will reward you. And if you do it, God will punish you. And the others are intermediate cases between those. So that in principle, it is entirely enforced by God. You then have courts, which are enforcing parts of it. But what they're enforcing, they, don't, they can't ask God. What they're enforcing is what the religious scholars have deduced from the Koran and the traditions of what, what Muhammad did and said, uh, the law ought to be. And in fact, in, Islamic, in Sunni Islamic law, there are four separate schools of law with different detailed views of the law, similar in general. And they are mutually orthodox. None of them claims the others are heretical because the view of all of them is that what this is is not God's word. This is our educated guess at God's word. And your educated guess might be different. So you've got sort of layers of scholars who work out methods of interpretation and opinions and sometimes disagree with each other and so forth. Uh, so the way the system worked traditionally uh, in most, much, perhaps most of the Islamic world is that if you had a legal question, which in their context could be a moral question, because since it's really enforced by God, you want to know what you should do even if you won't be punished by a court, you go to a mufti. What is a mufti? A mufti is a volunteer legal expert. And he is somebody who has studied in one, from one of the schools of law and is reasonably learned in its opinions. And if it's a moral question, you say, is it morally all right for me to do such and such? And he tells you. And if he says it's morally all right, you do it. And if not, maybe you don't do it. If it's a legal question, you say, under the following circumstances, what does the law say? And the mufti is not checking the circumstances. He doesn't know what actually happened. All he's doing is giving an opinion about the law. That's what's called a fatwa. It's an advisory legal opinion. And what happens to the fatwa, you now go to the court where you're suing somebody, you're in some kind of a legal conflict, and you say to the qadi, who is the judge who was appointed by the ruler, here is a fatwa from so-and-so who you know is a learned expert in the law, and it says the law is such and such. I claim the following facts. You, the qadi, have to check the facts and see if it's true. If my facts are true and his law is true, I should win the case. So it's an interesting division of labor. I like to say it's like the current American system turned upside down. Because in the American system, the law, the court of first impression figures out what happened and gives a verdict. And if one of the parties thinks that the court of first impression got the law wrong, you then appeal the case and it goes to the appeals court, which ignores the facts and just gives an opinion on the law. Whereas in the Islamic case, the opinion on the law comes first from the mufti, and then it's the uh, qadi, the, the judge, who gives the, the result on the facts. Uh, so one interesting question is, if I've described it right, why didn't the rulers control the law? And part of the answer is that, to some extent, they did. There were various, as I say, ways in which what I'm giving you is sort of a stylized set of facts. But there is a major, my, a, a modern scholar called uh, Halak. Uh, and his view is that in much of Islamic history, 
The Middle East consisted of Arab populations ruled by foreign, usually Turkish princes. Uh, Turkish or uh, Saladin was a Kurd, and they had an implicit deal with the legists, with the legal scholars. And the deal was that the legal scholars would tell people, yes, this prince is a legitimate ruler, you should obey him. And in exchange, the prince would say, I'll leave it to you to decide what the law is. That's your business. And as long as they did a, reason, a job he was happy with, that was a workable compromise. Now, I'm not sure if Locke is right, but at least it's an interesting story of how you maintained a system in which there were rulers, but nonetheless, they did not control the law. Uh, my standard modern American example of lawmaking is an organization called the American Law Institute, which is a private organization, a very prestigious organization. It's considered a great honor for a law professor to be invited to join the ALI. And they produce documents referred to as restatements. So the restatement of torts is their interpretation of the common law of torts. It has no legal power at all. But because they have a lot of prestige, if a judge is trying to decide how to rule on a hard case, he may well accept the ALI's version of how to interpret the law. If a legislature is trying to decide how to amend its statutes, it may well accept the ALI's proposal of how it ought to be done. So that's a case in which you have law which is being enacted publicly, but being designed privately, so to speak. All right. My final topic is what I think of as embedded law. That in the world of a thousand years ago, there were substantial areas such as Iceland where there was nothing much like a modern state. And in fact, you can argue that until the last few centuries, most of the world didn't have anything very much like, like a modern state. That what we're used to uh, in terms of a state controlling a whole lot of things is mostly a pretty modern development. Uh, in today's world, essentially all of it except for the high seas is under the rule of states. And that means that private law there is embedded law. Private law there is legal rules that some group of people enforce on their own members underneath the overshadowing umbrella of, of state law. And there are really two ways of doing it. One of them is to enforce it by acts that are illegal under state law, but that you can get away with so that I discussed the case of the Roman child, where uh, when you have cheated me and I threatened to beat you up, beating you up is assault and battery, it's illegal in British law, but as long as none of the, my fellow gypsies are gonna report me and you're not gonna report me because it'd be shameful for you to call in the non-gypsies into your quarrel, what kind of a wimp are you, you can't handle your own cases, uh, as long as that case exists, you may in fact be able uh, to do illegal things to enforce it. And the Sicilian Mafia would be a more famous example of the same pattern. The alternative, and probably more common, is that you have ways of imposing costs on members of your group which don't violate state law. And before we get to anything as exotic as the Vlachram or the Amish, let me point out that almost certainly this room is under embedded law. That is, my guess is, I don't know this university, but I know other universities, there are certain things students could do which will get them disciplined by the university. Uh, plagiarism, maybe, or I don't know what, what it would be. How does that work? The university's got the right to expel you, therefore they can use that as a punishment to enforce their own rules. So in that sense, embedded law is something you live with every day, even though you don't think of it in that term. Uh, the cases that I was going to mention uh, are two cases in both of which the ultimate punishment is ostracism. The Vlachram are the largest gypsy group. They're the people who are ensurfed in Romania for 400 years, and that's what you're most likely to encounter if you meet people who are called gypsies. And the Vlachram system is that if there is a dispute between two Vlachram, which they can't settle themselves, they ca call what is called a Chris Romani, which is a, a town meeting, as it were, of all adult males, and in some uh, Vlachram communities, women as well, and they all get together and they talk until they reach consensus. 
It's sort of a long kind of argument conducted in a special language, which is a variant of their language. Uh, and uh, when a consensus is reached, the result is then enforced on the parties who have the dispute by the threat of ostracism, by the threat that if they don't accept it, they will be declared modern may, polluted, which means that other gypsies will have nothing to do with them. Uh, again, I'm vastly oversimplifying. The gypsies are quite fascinating. I like to describe the gypsy institutions as Orthodox Judaism on steroids in the sense that they have an elaborate set of rules of cleanliness and uncleanliness, like kosher for those who are familiar with that. Uh, but that's not really relevant for, for what I'm talking about today, except to tell you something interesting you might want to read about someday. Uh, the Amish, it's essentially the same system. They're uh, rather uh, nicer people, or at least have better public relations than the gypsies do. But the Amish system is one in which the law, I should say, each congregation has its own ordinance, its own set of rules. The congregation is from 25 to 40 families because the Amish do not build churches or meeting houses. And therefore, the whole congregation has to be able to be squeezed into one large farmhouse for religious services and similar events. And when it gets too big, it splits, of course. And again, the Amish are fascinating, uh, but I'm not going to talk a lot about them. But the basic thing is that if you violate the ordnung, the first time you do it, one of the clergy of your congregation will come to you and point out what you're doing and ask you to apologize and ask you to stop. But if you keep on doing it long enough, at some point, you are uh, punished with maidung, which is ostracism. It's, I think, a less extreme ostracism than the gypsy version. Uh, other members of your congregation could still talk with you, but they're expected to keep a distance. So if you remain living in the house of your family who have not been uh, ostracized, you're, you should eat at a different table than they do. And you and your wife should not sleep together anymore and various things of that sort, which are putting a distance. And if another Amish had to do business with you, he'd probably hand the money to a third party who would hand it to you. So it's keeping you at a distance from them. And that's the ultimate, the ultimate punishment. Uh, or you can have cases in which both illegal and uh, legal acts are used to enforce it. Uh, and huh, I guess I, I want to, let me go back, which is a little bit tricky here because this is not a good Macintosh like I'm used to using, but one of these bizarre Windows machines. Oops, I wasn't supposed to be doing that. I thought I was going to the one I was in before. Just a minute, just a minute. Here we are. I hope this is right. What? I can go through all of them until I get to it, but there ought to be an easier way of doing this, and there would be on my machine. And there probably is on this machine, but I would have to know more than I know. All right, Shasta County, California. Uh, Robert Ellickson originally looked, this, this is the story of a book called Order Without Law by Robert Ellickson. And it's one of these funny cases where you do a research project for one purpose and discover something entirely different. I've had that happen too in some of my work. And in Ellickson's case, if some of you may have read uh, Coase's famous article, The Problem of Social Cost. And in that article, he discusses a situation where you have a problem of a rancher's animals trespassing on a farmer's field and damaging the crop. And one possible legal rule is the rule that is called open range, which says the rancher is under no responsibility to control his cattle. It's up for the farmer to build a fence to keep them out. And there's another rule called closed range, which says that it is the responsibility of the rancher to control his cattle. And so if they stray in, he owes damages to the farmer. And Coase argued, for reasons I'm not going to go into at the moment, that it didn't matter which rule you had that you would get the same result either way because if you had an open range, but if it was in fact cheaper for the rancher to fence his cattle in than for the farmer to fence him out, the farmer would basically pay the rancher to fence his cattle in. 
And somehow Ellickson discovered that Shasta County, which is a rural county, by historical accident is a patchwork of open and closed range. That parts of Shasta County, the rule is open range and part of it is closed range. And he said, wonderful, we can find out if Coase is right. Do they act the same way? And so he went to Shasta County and collected information. And he discovered that indeed Coase's conclusion was correct, but the reason had nothing to do with Coase's argument. That indeed farmers and ranchers behaved in the same way with regard to their straying cattle in open and closed range. But the reason was that the law of California with regard to straying cattle did not run in Shasta County. Why did it not run in Shasta County? Because Shasta County was a, it was a rural county, people were there for a long time, and it had very strong set of norms of neighborly behavior, of social views about how neighbors should behave. And one of the strongest norms of neighborly behavior is that neighbors don't sue neighbors. Hence, the law doesn't matter for the sort of thing you sue for. It still matters if you killed somebody. And so in the case of straying cattle, what the norms of neighborly behavior said were that if my cattle strayed into your field and ate your tomato plants, the first time it happened, I was supposed to be very apologetic, come over immediately and get my cattle out, maybe even help you replant your tomato plants. Uh, but suppose I don't. Suppose I eventually come over and I act as though it's no big thing and I refuse to help and it happens a couple more times. The first thing you do is to retaliate with true hostile gossip. You tell the rest of the neighbors what kind of a nasty person I am and pretty soon my wife doesn't get invited out to bridge parties and my kids don't get invited out to birthday parties and nobody wants to deal with me very much. But suppose I don't have a wife and kids, and I really don't care if anybody deals with me. I'm sort of a rather nasty, hostile person, and I keep letting my cattle stray. The next time, when you find my cattle on your land, instead of calling me up, you drive the cattle out of your gate, you drive the cattle the opposite direction from my ranch for five or six miles, and then you go home. And it's now up to me to try to figure out what happened to my cattle. All right, so that's a case in which the enforcement mechanism for the embedded rules in the mild case is legal, the gossip. It is illegal for me to drive your cattle away, but nonetheless, I can get away with it. The other neighbors regard it as legitimate behavior, uh, and therefore, therefore it works. All right, so that's an example of an set of embedded rules enforced in both ways. All right, illegal enforcement. In order for illegal enforcement, what you really need is the kind of group where members of the group won't betray other members of the group. That's one requirement. Uh, and ideally, a group where it's hard for the authorities to keep track of them to know who's doing what. Uh, gypsies tend to treat names as common property. That is to say, you might have your own name in the gypsy language, but John Smith is a name that belongs to your family. And sometimes I'm John Smith, and sometimes he's John Smith, and sometimes he's John Smith. And that makes it sort of hard to keep track of just who was who and who, who was where and so forth. Uh, and in general, gypsies tend to, as best they can, avoid being counted, registered in various ways, uh, get, uh, let the state pay attention to them. And part of the reason that the system works is that if you betray a member, then you yourself have acted badly from their standpoint, and then you will be punished in one way or another, whether legally or illegally. So it's a Nash equilibrium. As long as everybody else in the group believes that group members are obliged to conceal each other's crimes, then the result is that it pays to conceal each other's crimes, because otherwise you will be seen as a violator and get in trouble. Legal enforcement, generally by ostracism or something along those lines. And that needs a group that is sufficiently tight to make ostracism an effective sanction. And the traditional situation for the gypsies was that gypsies knew that everybody who wasn't a gypsy was ignorant and filthy because the non-gypsies did not obey the gypsy rules of pollution, the rules of what you could or couldn't do without getting polluted. Non-gypsies knew that gypsies stole chickens and maybe children and were generally untrustworthy, evil people. And the result was that if you were a gypsy, you had nowhere to go outside of the gypsy community. 
Hence, the threat of ostracism was an effective threat. One of the things that maintained, that, that threatened such a system is toleration. So that uh, I've argued that in North America, the gypsies may eventually vanish as an effective subculture because we're too tolerant. And therefore, it is relatively easy if the gypsy authorities try to make someone do something for that someone to say, goodbye, I'm going to vanish into the surrounding culture and live as if I was not a gypsy. Uh, similarly, uh, the gypsies would prefer not to have their children go to the public school, uh, maybe not learn to read. Uh, because those are things that make them more a part of the surrounding culture and thus reduce the gap. Another thing that might threaten the gypsies is radio and television because those allow you to participate in the culture, to observe what other people are doing without having to know how to read. The Amish, in a sense, seem to be the exception because they have succeeded in maintaining themselves for quite a long time, for well over 100 years. In spite of the fact, I like to say the big difference between the Amish and the Gypsies is the Amish have much better PR, much better public relations, that the Gypsies have a generally bad image. The Amish Americans imagine the Amish as sort of idealized 19th century farmers. That's not what they are, but that's their image. And they've actually been surprisingly successful in getting special treatment out of the US government. Not only are they immune from the military draft as pacifists, but when they were uh, drafted and then let off as, as, as pacifists, the normal thing was to send them to empty bedpans in an urban hospital somewhere. And that meant that the young Amish men were falling in love with non-Amish nurses, making friends with non-Amish roommates, and drifting out of the Amish society. The Amish didn't like that. And they persuaded the selective service system to set up farms run by either Amish or Anabaptists, uh, a related sect, at which Amish young men could do their war service by helping to run a farm along with other people like them. Uh, the Amish, oh, we have compulsory schooling in the US uh, normally through 12th grade, for the Amish it's through 7th grade. That the Amish basically persuaded the Supreme Court in a unanimous decision that they had the right to go home after seventh grade and to treat helping to run a household or a farm as a form of homeschooling, basically. So they've done very well. Uh, they're fluent in English. Amish are all bilingual. Their home language is one of two dialects of German, but they also speak English. They've done pretty well starting small businesses, so they could leave. And yet the Amish population has a doubling time of just over 20 years. They don't recruit. What the Amish have is traditional birth rates and modern medicine. And you can do the arithmetic of what happens. So there are more and more of them. And as far as I can tell, the way they pull it off is simply to have a society such that the people in it think it's better than the surrounding society. And about 10 to 20 percent leave each generation and the rest stay. So that's one of the interesting cases. All right. Social norms I already described. I don't know, I didn't realize it was here, but I've told you, so I'll go through that. What's the conclusion? That private law is in fact quite common. Uh, both private enforcement and private making of law. It's embedded in modern societies in a bunch of different forms, which I'm listing here, and it raises issues that are common to both the past and present examples. For more on this and much else, my web page is daviddfriedman.com. I have links to a number of my books that you can read for free online. Law's Order is my book on the economic analysis of law and has some of this stuff. Legal system is very different from ours is the draft of a book I'm writing. It includes a chapter on the Amish, a chapter on the Somali, lots more detail if you find some of the stuff I've been saying interesting. Machinery of Freedom was the, my first book written more than 40 years ago. And in part three, it sketched out an imaginary modern legal system. And I didn't realize at the time that I was reinventing the wheel, that what I was describing was a modern society with a modern version of basically a feud law system, which I discovered many years later. 
And then there are some articles from Imperial China to Cyberspace. I've described some of what's in it, but there's more in it. And a world of strong privacy is a description of what would it would look like if the possibilities of public key encryption were fully implemented. So that you had a world where all communications were private, where no third party could know what you were saying to each other, and where it was possible to deal with people with an online identity you could prove without telling them your real space identity, so that you could separate, uh, you could have anonymity and reputation at the same time. So I think that finishes what I wanted to say. Thank you. I talk too long, sorry. One question. Yes. So uh, suppose I, uh, I, uh, I had a car uh, injured me, so I, I got injured uh, in Hong Kong right now. I cannot sell my port plane to anyone else. Yes. And I cannot make a contract with a, uh, a lawyer saying that if he wins, then I only get this money. Yes. I cannot do that. Yes. Um, so, uh, but when I hear you saying that Iceland, I, Iceland actually has its port yep. plane in market, yep. it seems like it makes a lot of sense. Yes, I've, after I discovered this about Iceland, ever since then, I've been saying that the U.S. legal system is a mere thousand years behind the cutting edge of legal technology. Mm -hmm that there are a whole bunch of reasons why making tort claims marketable would make sense in a modern system. And one reason is that if you can't afford a lawyer, you could sell your claim to a law firm. Uh, one, in the US, I can make a contingency contract. I can agree that the law firm will get half the money and I'll get half the money. But I have no way of knowing which law firm will do a good job. I'm an ordinary person whose car has been dented. I can't judge them. Whereas if it's marketable, I just say, who offers me the highest bid? They're the ones who I want. That's, that's what matters to me. Furthermore, one of the problems in modern legal systems is how do you handle a tort that imposes small costs on a very large number of people? And the way we try to do it is what in, in the US system is what's called a class action in which you get, a, you get a few of the injured people to appoint you as your lawyer, and you get a judge to say that you get to represent 100,000 people who've never met you, and you then sue for all of them. And it's a very bad system because you have no incentive to do a good job for those 100,000 people. And therefore, a very typical result is that you get a settlement, which you agree to, in which the defendant agrees to pay you, the lawyer, $100,000, and he agrees to give the victims a million dollars, but not in cash. The million dollars consist of a $5 discount on the product he sells the next time they buy it. So that's not really a million dollars. You've in effect sold out your, your, your so-called clients uh, and gotten the money yourself. What's the alternative? If tort claims were marketable, you could then have people sell to middlemen all of their very small tort claims. So you could imagine that when I'm buying car insurance, for example, the insurance company says your price for this insurance is $1,000 a year, but we'll give you a deal. It's only 950 if you agree to transfer to us any claim you have for a tort whose damage is less than $100, which you'd never litigate anyway. Now, the insurance company now has seven million bundles of those. Some other organization has six million, another has 12 million and so forth. Now you're the lawyer who believes that he's discovered a mass tort, that he's discovered something which is imposing relatively small costs on many people. You go to the middleman and you say, I don't want all your claims. I just want your claims with regard to this particular sh issue. You know, I have found that asbestos has caused cancer. So all I want are your asbestos claims. Now the lawyer owns all of the claims. He sues on his own behalf as the owner of the claims. It is in his interest to get as large a damage payment as he can. The original victims have been compensated ex ante when they sold their claims and would never have gotten compensated any, under any other system. So that's one reason why it seems to me that the transferable claims would in fact be a very useful institution, which we unfortunately don't have. Yes. 
mentioned about reputation, uh, especially about when someone has reputation. But I was I was curious, uh, where is the reputation originally established? You establish your reputation by repeatedly doing things that show you to be an honest person. There are a number of different ways you could do it. One way would be by publicly making a donation to some charity that many people approve of. And the idea of that is that that is sort of a bond in the sense that having spent that money, if the next thing you do is to cheat people, people will say, well, turns out he wasn't a good guy after all. Uh, therefore, you've just thrown away your donation. Uh, this is a little bit like, it used to be the case in the U.S. in the 19th century, maybe still is, that banks tended to have headquarters that were very fancy with polished marble and so forth. And one economic explanation of why was that these were private banks in the 19th century, that the depositors were a little bit worried that the guy running the bank would take their money and leave, but if he had to leave behind him a worthless hunk of marble he paid a lot of money for, he probably wouldn't. So one way is you do things that make you visible. Another is you simply behave honestly and visibly for quite a while, so that you do contracts where the other party has a reputation, uh, or contracts where you could cheat but it wouldn't hurt them very much, so they're willing to take the risk. And after they've observed, after other people have observed your behavior, they say, yeah, this is an honest guy. We're willing to deal with him. And the longer you keep doing this, the more valuable the reputation is because the more people are willing to trust you, which makes it easier for you to do business with them. Yes? That is the corruption case. The point is that a corrupt uh, judge, once people know he's corrupt, nobody's willing to agree to use him as their judge. Uh, and in terms of probability and punishment, one of the issues which, one of the talks I sometimes give which is distantly related to this is entitled, Should We Abolish the Criminal Law? And what that is doing is not considering fully private systems, but imagining something like Iceland in the sense of treating all offenses as torts rather than crimes. And one of the issues that arises there is if you have an offense where it's hard to detect what happened, now the uh, offender may not be able to pay a large enough damage to make it worth suing him. Because you have to spend resources, you only have one chance in 10 of catching him, the standard rule would suggest, well, he pays tenfold damages if you catch him, but he doesn't have total tenfold damages. And then that system works fairly poorly. On the other hand, uh, you can still have what are essentially reputational mechanisms on the victim's side in that you can, in effect, make deterrence a private good if you arrange things in such a way that the other criminals know that you went to the trouble of catching somebody and doing whatever you can do to him. And my standard example of this comes from an article I did on 18th century English criminal law, which was interesting because it was on paper the same legal system we have, but there were no police or public prosecutors. So in fact, it was privately enforced by the victims. And the question is, since unlike tort law, you don't collect any damages in criminal law, all you do is hang the guy, uh, why did they do it? And one answer is that they did it for deterrence, and the way they did it was to create associations for the prosecution of felons. And an association for the prosecution of felons was a group of people in one town who all paid an annual sum to the association, which created a pool of money that was used to pay the cost of prosecuting anybody who committed a felony against them. So far it sounds like insurance, but it's not insurance, it's commitment because the final step is to publish in the newspaper the list of the members for the felons to read. So what you're doing is saying, look, don't rob me. I've paid in advance, and so you're going to get prosecuted if you rob me. So that's one way in which what's driving it is not a damage payment, but the desire to deter crimes against yourself. 
The general probability punishment issue is a complicated issue. If you're really curious about it, if you look in my law's order, which I think is on my web page, uh, I have a discussion of that issue, which I believe significantly improves upon Gary Becker's discussion of that issue. Of status? Yes, they call you to use your island of no king. But without king, it didn't mean without state. Maybe the meaning of state can be very flexible. We can think the Jigsaw society is a somewhat instituted within the state. It's functionally very similar by the state. If you want my answer to that, but my full answer to that question, on my web page, there are the new <laughs> chapters for the machinery of freedom. And one of those chapters is partly dedicated to answering the question of what's a government. Because it's a hard problem, if you think about it, that everything that governments do has at some time and place been done by somebody not a government, including invading people. That I don't know how much English history you know, but the, the Danish armies that ravaged England that, Al, that Alfred the Great eventually fought were not national armies. They were entrepreneurial projects. They were basically a leader who says, look, there's gold and land in England. Come on, boys, let's go. So everything governments do, do is also done by non-governments. And my answer, very shortly, because it's a long answer, is that part of the way human societies work is that humans have a set of commitment strategies which define their rights. And what I mean by the commitment strategy is there are certain things which if you do to me, I'm willing to bear unreasonably large costs to stop you or to get back at you. And in a fun, that's part of what structures human society, why it's not Hobbes' uh, war of each against all. A government is that organization against which we drop those commitment strategies. So that when an ordinary private person comes to me and says, I've got a job, you're going to do it if you don't all lock you up, I'm willing to fight pretty hard to stop them. When I get a notice from the government saying, show up for jury duty on Tuesday, I'm not willing to fight hard to stop it because my normal commitment strategy against enslavement doesn't apply against governments. Ditto for other things governments do. So I think the most useful definition is that a government is an agency which can do the sorts of things that would be seen as rights violations done by other people without provoking the kind of response that it normally responds to rights violations. And in that sense, uh, I don't think Iceland had a government, that everybody had the same rights. Uh, I can kill you if you're an outlaw, you can kill me if I'm outlawed. So, thank you all.